When I think about African cities today, I think of mega cities like Lagos, secondary cities like Dakar, economic powerhouses like Johannesburg, or ancient cities like Timbuktu. But we have now reached a critical stage in human history. Africa is the world's second most populous continent, with the fastest growing cities expected to triple by 2050. And 59% of the population lives in peri-urban or informal settlements, often in hazardous zones due to their affordability and proximity to jobs and services. So what is the nature of these peri-urban settlements? Growth rates are unprecedentedly high. For example, in Namibia, at about 11% per annum, compared to only 4% in formal areas. Many depend on open defecation, rigged electricity, with informal tenure. Peri-urban areas are disproportionately at risk due to climate change. Two of the most deadliest hazards are flood risk and heat exposure, because homes are often constructed in riparian zones and indoor temperatures can be up to four to five degrees Celsius hotter than ambient temperatures. And with COVID, these vulnerabilities will be worsened with approximately 100 million people pushed into extreme poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. Thus, peri-urban areas are often larger and more populous than the formal city. But with one big difference, there is no central government. Local authorities are often unable to deal with the sheer magnitude and rate of these changes while traditional methods of urban planning are incomplete, if not inadequate. You may think that this complex trend is a tidal wave which cannot possibly be addressed, but I'm going to show you something different. Throughout my career, I've been fortunate enough to work with many great conservation biologists, urban planners, community organizers, and when traveling to over 60 countries, I've observed unbounded resilience found within these localities. I found that perhaps there's something that we can learn about adaptation. Until tools for urban planning and design are expanded, and new futures methods are mainstream that account for uncertainty, predictions will be grossly inaccurate, and governance and financing will continue to be based on short-termism. Here's what some of the new approaches look like. We envision revisiting Wangari Matai's Green Belt vision of restoring functioning biodiverse green infrastructure across peri-urban catchments, bringing in a planetary health perspective. Green spaces are not only parks, but interlinked systems which support equity, connectivity, and reduce climate hazards. To do this, we conduct analyses across catchments, from upland mountain systems to lowland peri-urban settlements, using participatory futures tools to understand human-nature interactions. We harness big data and AI to build early warning systems. And through this work, surprising adaptations have already been shown. For example, in Havana in Vintuk, residents design open spaces to make informal settlements look more like home. Green spaces provide sport and meeting areas, food or fodder, biodiversity, and help communities adapt to climate change by reducing heat stress, using shade, or sequestrating carbon. Similarly, along the Umsambazi River Valley in Dar es Salaam and in the Cape Flats, every year homes are flooded for three months. When walking through the streets, it's clear that life has been adapted to the specific way of living. Ecological infrastructure provides interconnected green spaces that are used differently across different seasons. And in Mathari Valley slums, which runs along the Nairobi River, we see a growing culture of innovation and revitalization. As residents shift from employing more generic coping strategies to flooding, such as evacuating homes, to restoring riparian buffer zones that filter water and reduce erosion. All of these examples demonstrate the kind of resourcefulness, ingenuity and agility that can provide solutions in the absence of more formal planning. From Dar es Salaam to Vintuk, these communities have approached the design of their neighborhoods responding directly to the environmental changes that regularly arise. These areas offer examples of the kind of socio-ecological stress anticipated in more established societies. They are a looking glass into the future. As I end, I'm trying to demonstrate that climate resilience, urban planning, conservation and human health cannot continue to be considered separately.